Good evening, this is Charles Kelly. Hope you, hope you're doing well. Now, should the government extend the stamp duty holiday? Uh, just, just to fill you in on this, uh, in the UK, when we buy a property, we pay uh, stamp duty. Uh, it's, it's a tax, really, it's, uh, and it's it, it used to be payable when you uh, bought a property, and they would stamp the deeds with with a a stamp, uh, kind of verifying it, and 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 the stamp was like a penny or something like that, something silly, um, and. And so it literally was a stamp, and that was your stamp duty to show that you paid the duty on the transaction. Because as you know, everything you do, you want to buy something, sell something, the government has to take a, a slice of the action, a bit like the mafia. Well, now stamp duty's got to the stage where it's not just a few pounds or even 1%. You know, in some cases you can pay five, six, and even more percent of the property value on, on a property. And if you're an investor, you have second homes, then they add another 3% on top of the, the normal stamp duty. So so often, just buying a semi-detached house around London, you could be paying, I mean, I, I bought one a, a year ago and it, the stamp duty was £34,000. It's an obscene, ridiculous amount of money. And that was considered to be holding back some, some people buying properties. So what the government did last July during the coronavirus crisis is uh, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak said, we will have a stamp duty holiday from July until the end of March, <clears throat> where they're reducing the stamp duty by increasing the threshold on which the stamp duty is paid. And, and, and actually it seems to have worked because the market really then picked up, partly due to, to that and, and due to the pent up demand that was uh, built up during the lockdown. But the property market has no doubt picked up uh, and you know, it says mortgages approvals were were actually up uh, by by ten percent on the previous month, and five uh, percent on five point nine percent on the previous month. Ninety seven thousand mortgage approvals in uh, October, and it was fifty percent up, fifty one percent up on the previous time last year. So it, it's it's good news in that way. And HMRC figures show that housing transactions, these are completions, hit. 105,000 last month and that's up you know nearly 10 percent on the September before so th this stamp duty holiday has encouraged people to go out and buy however it takes around you know three to five months to complete from getting a mortgage to, to buying a house and completing it can take five or six months so if you started last July or August that's fine but what if you hadn't found a house or something had fallen out of bed and you tried again um, what if you've only just got your mortgage in October? The chances are you may not complete by the end of March and, and then the stamp duty, you'd have to pay that stamp duty, which could cost some buyers up to £15,000 extra on top of the purchase price and their deposit and that sort of thing. So experts, experts are now warning that property transactions will run out of time and just collapse. And I was speaking to an estate agent today. He said the worst thing that can happen is if you've been trying to sell a property, you sell it, they get their mortgage, and then for whatever reason, maybe there's a chain of people involved, it doesn't complete by the by March, then everything falls out of bed. The estate agent doesn't even get paid. They only get paid on completion, on results. So and, and thousands and, and the other thing is that thousands of mortgages were granted and approved on the basis that no stamp duty would be payable. Because people say, well, what's your deposit? Well, I've got this 10% deposit or a 15% deposit, whatever it is. And they, the lender takes that into account and the affordability, but it doesn't take into account the fact that you're gonna to have to pay a lot more stamp duty on top. <coughs> so these mortgages have been approved on that basis and lenders could decide, well, you know, you, you now got stamp duty to pay. We're gonna to have to reassess your, your uh, mortgage, mortgage viability and your ability to pay. Uh, and that they could withdraw offers if they don't complete by March, which would be an absolute disaster uh, for, for borrowers and, and agents and, and sellers as well. So, and, and experts are saying there's not simply not enough manpower to even get these cases through. But by, the, you know, if people are buying now, you know, there's not that many solicitors that can, uh, can, can uh, are, are available. My solicitor is working flat out. He works till you know seven or eight, nine o'clock at night. He's working flat out. Apparently, there's not enough surveyors to to do the mortgage valuations on these properties. They're working flat out. So if you if you got your mortgage application and you put it through and it gets approved, you might have to wait three or four weeks for a surveyor to go out and get that report back. So it's all these problems that are happening. Plus, you've got the usual thing about just delays with you know a case going through because if somebody's selling a property where are they going to move they've got to buy a property 
uh, you know, unless it's a new build, of course. But, you know, you might have a chain of people in, 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 the, in the chain and all waiting to move. And it might not happen by March. So the long and the short of it is that the, uh, the, 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 you know, the industry and I was speaking to a mortgage industry insider yesterday. They are really pushing the government to extend this this stamp duty holiday. Uh, otherwise, you can, you know, it's going to be disaster. And also you could get a slump you know, next March when it just stops. So let's see what happens. The Bank of England said there's there's definitely been a spike in mortgage approvals and, and that's good news. Uh, and, we, and we need maybe another few months, maybe another three to six months to get all these cases through and to get everybody settled in. Um, so that, that's that's what's been happening. Um, Zoopla is, is predicting that transactions in December could hit 140,000 uh, transactions, the highest December since 2006. Now, interestingly enough, we, 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 we are at the moment in the lowest interest rate period of, of virtually of all time, I think. That's Bank of England base rates on which banks can lend money between them. It's nearly at zero. And you think, well, that's great. The lenders would be reducing their mortgage rates and passing it on to the borrowers, right? Well, wrong. They're actually increasing interest rates. They've certainly increased rates on, on a deal that I took uh, this year. Um, you know, to pay more than I was paying on the previous deal when I was just renewing a deal and I, I couldn't believe it had gone up and, and the amount of good rates had gone down. Yes, they've actually increased their, their rates uh, and really taken advantage and hitting people where it hurts at a time when they've got no other choice. And a, a commercial analyst called Anthony Codlin from uh, Twindig said, average rates now for a new 95% uh, two-year fixed rate mortgage was 4.09%. You know, that's, 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 you know, dozens and dozens of times the, the, the base rate, when you consider it's less than 1%, it's like 0.1%. It's, it's obscene, the amount that the lenders are charging on these. Um, it, it's just absolutely obscene. Uh, and, and then, um, and that, he, he's estimated that's a 35% increase on the rates at the start of 2020 when interest rates were higher. So it's unbelievable. Um, and, and I think that they're really just, uh, it's, it's not in a rip-off, but it's actually taking advantage of people in their weakest position. And, and also, uh, I read that there's, there's not that many 95% mortgages around. That's that, I think that's probably why uh, most lenders are insisting on larger deposits. So, you know, parents and grandparents having to perhaps remortgage their own properties in order to help people get on the ladder. So it's been a bit of a mad scramble. And, you know, in my experience... Uh, oh, Whenever you get a situation like this, like when they, they abolished uh, double Myris relief many years ago, I think the end of the 80s, there was this mad scramble. They said at the end of September that this, this tax relief will go. I won't go into the ins and outs of the benefit. You used to get tax relief on your mortgage interest, which they don't, you don't now. And that they announced that this double tax relief on, on single couples was going to end. And there was this mad scramble to buy. And I remember selling a flat during that period and there was like three bidders all racing to buy it before August. And then after that, there was a massive slump. I think it was the end of the 80s. And there was a massive slump and it didn't recover then uh, for five or six years. So I, I, I think th this could could see a, a big slump. And the question is, is it worth it rushing in to buy a property, maybe at a high price with a high mortgage, uh, just to save a few thousand pounds in stamp duty when you could see a drop in price? You know, if you bought a property for... You know, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and it and it drops by ten percent over the next couple of years. You know, that's that's twenty five thousand pounds reduction, and then you're stuck with a, with an expensive mortgage. But you know, buying a house, I suppose, is a long long term investment if you're you're living in it. So it doesn't really matter if it fluctuates that much. Uh, but but another uh, economist, uh, Andrew Wishart, said, uh, you know, the usual channels through which the recession hits the housing market like, for instance, rising unemployment, mortgage payment difficulties have been mitigated this this time through the furlough scheme, mortgage payment holidays and a moratorium on repossessions and, and of course, the stamp duty holiday. And, and meanwhile, the market's got this pent up demand uh, and, you know, people need more space because they're working at home or they want to move out of town to, to the countryside. And, you know, that's that boom made, made this little market boom. But. The policy support, he said, that has protected and boosted the market this year is due to be withdrawn in 2021. At some time, it's going to be withdrawn. These schemes may be increased, uh, extended, but sometime they're going to go. 
and the unemployment rate is going to hit 7%. And I'll come on to unemployment in a second. Uh, so, and he said that the housing market has never escaped unscathed a drop in employment on the scale that we forecast. I'll repeat that. The housing market has never escaped unscathed from a drop in employment of the scale we are forecasting. Uh, so that's interesting. And I've seen this before myself, but a lot of gurus say, no, property market, you know, property market is going to be OK. It might be right for the next year or so, but it can't just keep going like this. Um, in fact, isolation, uh, the historical relationship between employment and house prices suggests a 25 percent house price crash in the offing. Uh, he doesn't say when. Uh, our view is that the annual fall, an annual fall of five percent in quarter four of 21 is more likely. So he's saying that if you link the house prices directly to employment, that would suggest a 25 percent drop. But he thinks it will drop by maybe five percent in the fourth quarter of next year. Um, and he just says, look, the, 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 the outlook remains exceptionally unclear, given that the government policies might change. Stamp duty, duty holiday could be extended and the government might follow through on plans to introduce a mortgage guarantee scheme uh, next year. And I think that that is definitely coming. I was speaking to an insider recently. He said a mortgage guarantee scheme uh, is being worked on, but it might not happen immediately. And I, I, some of that, I've got to credit some of that source of that information from uh, thisismoney.co.uk. And so, uh, so that's very interesting what's happening in the market there. Now, other, other news is that we talked about unemployment just now. Uh, 25,000 retail jobs are now in jeopardy that they're going to go at some stage or certainly they, they may go and that's because Debenhams and Arcadia two of the biggest high street names are, have both gone into administration now, I remember we talked about this last week Arcadia is the top shop uh, Dorothy Perkins Evans they've got places shops all over the place owned by the famous or infamous Sir Philip Green and uh, and then Debenhams have been around for 250 years on the high street. They started with one store, I think, in Oxford Street. But it's, it's been a massive part of people's lives, Debenhams. And I was sad to see that my local Debenhams closed uh, this year. And in fact, right next to Debenhams in, in my uh, local shopping parade, there's a Debenhams. Then there's a, a an Arcadia, almost two doors away. And, and both of those are now closing. Then next to that is a Sports Direct shop owned by Mike Ashley. Now, he's been sniffing around Debenhams and Arcadia, seeing if he can pick up some of the uh, the gems from the, the liquidators. And then the next to that, you've got JD Sports, next to a Sports Direct. And JD Sports, just last night or today, pulled out of a deal to, to buy Debenhams, perhaps because they couldn't get the right price. So all these three shops are in, in a line. It's, it's very interesting. And, of course, um, you know, th th this... This collapse will mean that businesses uh, will, will go into administration. That means, what does it mean? It means 25,000 people lose their job. 25,000 people not paying tax. 25,000 uh, companies, uh, people, companies paying no insurance, national insurance on 25,000 people. Corporation tax goes. And then to add to it, to double whammy, is that those people then go on benefits. So the, the taxpayer is already short of their tax, has to then fund them and pay for their, their rent or their mortgages. And, and just pay them an income to keep them alive. So that's a, it's a massive blow. And that's not the only one where we're, 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 we're losing jobs. That's just one, two, two companies going into administration. And I know the high street has been hit uh, in, in general by online retailing, but not every high street is going out of business. Uh, but, th but that's certainly a massive blow. Now, businesses, uh, I also read, I just want to move on to another subject, is that... Um, Businesses, now we know that the vaccine's coming, right? And they've said in Parliament that there will not be a forced vaccination programme. This is not communist China. After all, we don't expect to be forced to have a vaccination. A lot of people still feel the vaccination may not be safe. It normally takes five to ten years to, to approve a vaccination. Uh, so, so why is that been rushed through at such undue haste now within months and, and expecting us to, to, to take this. So a lot of people don't agree with, with the vaccination as such. Uh, but, but I read today that, uh, this is one headline. Uh, it, now it says, no jab, you're barred. Restaurants and bars and cinemas may turn customers away if they've not had a COVID jab, uh, says the new minister for mass vaccine rollout. Uh, that's Nadim Zahali, who's the new minister for uh, the vaccine, I guess, and, and for COVID. 
And he said it would be up to businesses to decide whether to impose their own uh, restrictions on people who don't have uh, a vaccine. Uh, that, that's almost infringing on our, our freedoms and our rights. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories here, but um, it, it does seem to infringe on rights. I've heard of an airline, I think it was Qantas, who, who may insist on people having a vaccine before they can fly. Well, I certainly won't be flying with Qantas anyway, uh, but it, it is a worrying trend that, that, that they could do this. Personally, I think even if you had a vaccine, it doesn't necessarily mean you're 100% immune. You might have had a vaccine six months ago and it's worn off or, or, or the strain has changed. The strain has mutated into another strain, just like flu vaccines. What would be better is if you have a test the day before, which some airports are already implementing here, you have a test to say you're COVID free. That's more likely to be foolproof than a vaccine you might have had three or four months ago. So, so that's, that's a worrying trend. And the other thing you hear that's happening here on another subject is that there's definitely sort of growing divide between the rich and poor in terms of the effect that coronavirus is having on people. And some people say it's due to a north-south divide. There are more cities in the north where in the north of England where it's you know the virus has been more virulent and these cities are now being put into tier three whereas London and most of the south have been put into tier two but there was a there was a a, a, a spot on BBC news last night which showed uh, two church people going around to people in in a poorer area Burnley and going around with a food wagon that feeds people and gives them hot food and this was like a mad scramble. It was like one of these refugee camps or places where there's been a disaster or famine where people were fighting to get to food and people in wheelchairs couldn't get there. And it was terrible in this day and age that people need food and they haven't got the money to buy food. So there is this growing divide. And yet at the same time, an economist told me that on average, people have got more money in their bank accounts now than they did before the lockdown. On average, these are not the poorest of the poor, but on average, the middle classes have got even up to £10,000 more in their bank accounts than they had before the lockdown. Why is this? Lower spending. Uh, the, the job furlough scheme is putting money still in their pockets. Uh, they don't have to spend. They're not out spending in the shops. They're not going on holiday. Uh, they're not spending so much on fares going in, in and out of town. That can cost you know £5,000 a year just to commute into London. So it's spending is down. And, and also people have benefited from various grants and uh, bounce back loans and, and various things. Now, not, everyone, not everyone's in this position, but on average, people will have more money in their account at this moment. And yet there are people in this country who haven't got enough money to feed their children. So anyway, there are more articles on and, and this. You know, I wrote this book, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness, not to say that just could you have money, it will buy you happiness. But you can't say to those people who haven't got money to buy food that a bit of money wouldn't help them. And you can't say to the charities that need uh, the money to feed these people, uh, you know, wouldn't do with a bit more money and, and it wouldn't make a lot of people happy, just a small amount of money. So anyway, that, that's the news today. Now, getting back to this, the, these businesses that are going into administration, we know that you know, a lot of people are gonna lose jobs. Tax, the taxpayer and the councils are gonna lose council tax, taxes, and you know, people who've got shares in those companies will lose their money. But somebody will be making a fortune out of the collapse of Debenhams and Arcadia. There are already vultures hovering around to pick up the pieces cheap, to pick up assets. And in fact, one of the reasons why deals like this fall through before administration is that they say, well, I'd rather buy the company when it's in administration, when it is really hits rock bottom, than buy it from you now to save the company. They'd rather let it go down wipe out all the debts, wipe out the tax liabilities, wipe out the rent liabilities, and then pick up the pieces. So somebody's gonna make a lot of money. In fact, Philip Green, who, who owns Arcadia, his last company, BHS, was sold for a pound. It was a scandal. Uh, obviously it had a lot of debts, but sold for a pound. Somebody made a lot of money out of that. Accountants make a lot of money, administrators make a lot of money. So how does it work? How do people buy businesses for a pound? And how do people make millions of pounds overnight in just one deal? Just like Philip Green did. He bought alien businesses, turned them around a bit. Uh, their share price went up. He took massive dividends. He's taken 12 billion pounds of dividends out of businesses that he bought and probably didn't even use his own money. So he's sitting on a yacht in Monaco. His wife uh, collected the dividends. She doesn't, she's not even a UK taxpayer, so they earn 12 billion tax free from these businesses. So how does it work? Well, if you want to know more about buying and selling businesses, there's, a, there's actually a webinar tomorrow night called the Business Buying Opportunity Webinar, and it will tell you the strategies 
and the tactics that this person has used, Jonathan Jay has used, to, to buy and sell businesses, even during this recession, even during this lockdown. In fact, he's bought six businesses which have made him uh, a lot of money, made him millions. And, and the real secret to finding businesses, and it's not cold calling or looking on LinkedIn. Um, so that's that been interesting. Well, it's, it's absolutely free. Um, he's made three million pounds during the lockdown buying and selling businesses and he doesn't use his own money and he's not in there running the business or flipping a burger or something. So have a look at that. It's tomorrow night. Uh, check it. Check it out. I'll put a link up for this and I do have a look at it. And, uh, you know, if you, if you can't get into the link, just let me know. But but thanks for listening anyway and have, have a great evening and, and bye for now. Thanks to all the Facebook uh, listeners, uh, Dagmar and everybody who's, who's tuning in there. Like, nicely, all the way from Norway there. Great to see you. Hope you're doing well. Um, I, I don't think you're as badly affected in Norway as we are here. But certainly here we've gone into a, a tier system, which is, is, is not a full lockdown. But, you know, it, it almost might as well be a full lockdown. Uh, for, you know, if you, if you look at what um, some people are going through, uh, it, it almost might as well be. A, I mean pubs in parts of Wales from this Friday will have to close and and believe it or not they can open up but they can't sell beer <laughs> it's ridiculous um, other pubs have to open up but they have to serve meals in order to sell beer um, I don't know it's, it's all become a little bit disjointed in fact we've got into this tier system uh, two days before uh, results come out showing that the, the previous lockdown is actually working. It's, the numbers of infections have gone down, but we'd already launched this tier system before. And a lot of uh, Boris Johnson's own MPs on the back benches have rebelled against this today. The Labour Party have, have, have abstained in voting for this tier system to go through. But a lot of his MPs, senior MPs and former ministers, have rebelled against this. They've spoken out against it. They're not happy that in their constituency, you know, in Northampton, millions of people have been put into a tier, which may not affect the whole of the county. Some of Northampton is very rural. Uh, other parts are, are big cities. So, so a lot of MPs are upset. A lot of people are upset uh, that, that going into Christmas, busy time of the year for retailers, busy time of year for restaurants, catering, hospitality are all going to be uh, suffering th this, this year and this Christmas. And that's after a, almost a year of lockdown where the economy has shrunk by 11.8% and the government is now two trillion in debt because of all the handouts they've had to make to, to keep things going. So I think something's got to be done. I don't think it's the right way of doing it. But thanks for listening. And I hope this hasn't depressed you too much, all this stuff. But I, I give you this information so that you can make informed decisions about what to do with your money. So this is Charles Kelly bringing you money tips to help you save, earn, invest, accumulate and enjoy more money. Thanks for listening.